Hi, my name is Joel Miller, and today we are on my podcast, Party Like a Rockstar. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese spreads on the market today. They're delicious and healthy, made from a cashew and almond milk and blended with various locally sourced fresh herbs, vegetables, and spices. There's no vegetable oil, soy, fillers, starches, or nutritional yeast. It's lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, pareb, and 100% vegan. My guest today is Frank Scrambalone. He's a veteran. He's the oldest guy I know on the road with a full head of hair. Why? <laughs> because his job is the least stressful one out there. Frank's a front of house sound engineer who's toured with Godsmack, Rob Zombie, Alice in Chains, the Dixie Chicks, Luke Bryant, the Goo Goo Dolls, the Moody Blues, Linda Ronstadt, Soundgarden, Megadeth, the Sex Pistols, Pantera, and Iggy Pop. The artist list is long because the aforementioned bands had to clearly move on to hire better sound guys. Which <laughs> that is so right. That is so true. <laughs> Such an asshole. <laughs> my second shit bag. That's so my fucking true. Special guest. The only guy I know who's had to run sound for more boring bands is my surprise guest, Maxi Williams. <laughs> Maxie, <laughs> a much more respectable job than Frank's, I might add. From 1984 to 1992, he owned and operated Maxi Sound, where he did both lighting and sound. I can only assume the company went under because of Maxi's subpar lighting skills. <laughs> As I was writing this, I called him and he was hanging a ceiling fan. That's what roadies do when we're not employed, by the way. He it's called a pandemic. In an hour and 45 <laughs> minutes. Truthfully, I'm guessing that was just to get the fan out of the box. <laughs> Maxie, Frank, and I worked together on the Stone Tumble Pilots, Godsmack, and Disturbed Tour in 2001. If had been better teachers, maybe, just maybe, I would have been a better roadie. Other acts that Maxie's worked That's for so are Marilyn journey. Manson, Megadeth, Guns N' Roses, Seal, Stain, Dolly Parton, Tanya Tucker, Journey, and Five Finger Death Punch. Maxie, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I don't know, a sound guy? <laughs> Young guys. <laughs> so I've got a big issue, dude. That I've listened to your Mistress Carrie podcast, Frank. Yeah. I can't. It's Frank, Frank Scrambalone. It's it's awful. I can't ever get out of my head for the rest of my yeah. life. Yeah. But I'm singing the fucking song more often than I would have. We used you to sing that on God's back, huh, Frank? Oh, <laughs> dude. I I, it's, I don't know how many years ago that record was released, but it doesn't matter where I go, who the artist is, and what kind of crew around him. Somebody comes up, hey, guess what that rhymes with? Yeah, no kidding. No kidding, dude. Yeah, what's that? Have you heard all this? Uh, no, uh, no. Tell them the story. So... You know, by the way, uh, you know, we could have been better teachers. You might be not podcasting from some fucking place. You're burying bodies on the weekend. I don't, <laughs> know, what, I don't know what you got going on back there, but I'm, I'm looking at some satanic ventriloquist Muppet. Oh, he yeah, looks like he's that? about to come back and stab you. What is that behind oh, you? My co-host. My co <laughs> is, yeah. is he really? He's the brains of the operation. I saw a lot of art and memorabilia now. He's actually from the 1920s. He's a uh, Day of the Dead paper mache <laughs> puppet. My, my girlfriend actually had a nightmare about him 10 years ago, and she was like, he came alive, oh. and she couldn't kill him because he's made out of paper mache. She was throwing water at him. Well, at least you don't have to blow him up, and you, you don't have to throw gasoline at it. It'll just burn. <laughs> <laughs> mustache, dude. It's crazy. It's his yeah. Old the, uh, so, so the song, right? We were finishing uh the the album tour before and i'm gonna i'm gonna mess it up just chronologically i don't remember it might have been uh wake uh wake the fuck up tour i think it may have been we were finishing up and everybody was on kind of a like we were feeling pretty good everybody had been working really hard for, and they were writing you know they had a studio little you remember that max for a while they everybody carry around like a, a small production studio if you oh, will oh yeah and it's the jam room. shit up every fucking night. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, they would write. And one day he was dicking around at Soundcheck with that riff. 
I was sitting there and it just caught my ear. And I was like, hey, that's really good, man. You should probably start a song with that. And he looks at me dead serious and just laughs. <laughs> Fuck face. I'm going to start the next record with this. Like he, he already knew like, oh, this is, this is good, right? It was, it was ear catching. And then when they started coming up with the lyrics, and I've only heard this from conjecture because I wasn't there, but they said that like in his, uh, you know, his scratch sheets, that was what he came up with. I'm Scambalone. And he was looking for something, you know, before he knew what the lyric was going to be. So he figured out something that rhymed with it and everybody thought it was hilarious. Then I went to work for, you know, the Seven Dust guys and they're just roaring. I mean, the first, it was all day, every day. Every time I walked into a room, Morgan Rose would scream it at the top of his lungs. It was hilarious. And then it wasn't. And then it still wasn't. And then it was like, it was like a Jerry Seinfeld joke from the first episode of the show. Like, yes, I've heard this. Yes, I get it. You're killing me, dude. I was, I was, yeah, I was screaming like, all those lyrics and that we would be doing line check and I would be screaming that through the PA system oh. in the arenas. Oh my God. The Seinfeld. Oh, the days are fun. You guys gave me my nickname there. The Rifkin names from that stupid Seinfeld episode. Where we, yeah, well. It fucking wasn't for me. There was that, that whole night at uh, LA at Universal Amphitheater. When your parents came and when, uh, the Sex Pistols dude came, right? Uh, no, that was the producer from one of the STP records who shall remain nameless because he'll probably sue the shit out of me. Uh, <laughs> or Glenn he, Campbell. Man, no. Campbell came. The Rhinestone Cowboy? Oh. Yeah. Dude, was it really? Shows. Yeah, and Dean was giving me shit because I didn't know. Oh, well, yeah. I had no idea. Well, Dean was a muso, right? Everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, so was the taxi. I don't know about Frank there. That's fine. Yep, he just came to the show. There he goes. Frank's back. <laughs> Frank did a freeze frame. <laughs> My internet connection is unstable. Yeah, tell me about it. Oh, Dude, wow. you're down oh. in the fucking basement. I felt like I'm doing your laundry about to put in the punching bag there. <laughs> no. All right, so no, that was my uh that was my um quarantine pandemic uh project. Get get myself back to fighting weight. Uh, yeah, but I'm yeah, that was that night at Universal. Your dad came, and I did not know who Joel Rifkin was. I had no idea. Yeah, and everybody's like, and McGee came over with your dad, and he said, "Oh, this is uh, Joel's dad." And I said, "Mr. Rifkin," and stuck my hand out to shake him, and he just looked at me like, "You douchebag," <laughs> and walked off. I don't. And then about an hour later. The record producer showed up and he was hanging out next to Maxie's desk with some stripper wannabe. I don't know what it was going on, yeah, right? That would have Strippers been at mom. Modern World? Yeah, no, it was not yeah, your mom, mom Joel. Mom. <laughs> but yeah, there was some, some the dude, he was there and he was dragging his drink, elbows. On, I mean, literally, like, I wouldn't stand there. I'm the guy teching for Max. <laughs> and Max is like, what is this guy doing? I was like, I don't know. I was like, finally, like, Hey, listen, you're, you're going to have to back it up here. You and the girlfriend, whoever you are, you got to back it up. You, you're standing over the console with a drink and not having it. I was gonna say, oh, don't worry. Did it don't. put coffee on the console? Because Max. No, it was a drink, drink mixed yeah. drink, like rocks glass with liquor. Oh, yeah. And I don't know how far he's into it. I don't give a shit. I, I can't replace the desk in like 10 minutes. You know, and the band's standing like 20 feet behind us. They're ready to go on. And he's over there and he's giving me grief. He's like, no, don't worry about it, dude. I make records. I know about all this shit. I go, if you knew anything about me, you would back the fuck up. Now get out of the way, dude. Seriously. And Charlie Hernandez sees the look on his face. He sees the look on my face. And he comes into the middle of it and just basically just cleans house. It was like swipe. He's out. And that was the that was the end of the. He literally just parted us all and the band walked through, walked on stage. And that was the end of it. Oh, Charlie, Charlie doing his good, job, but it's amazing yeah. like the command that guy has. He's a big guy, he's a scary guy, but it's amazing yep. that he can just he can pull like, like whatever. Everybody's like, okay, I'm done. And they just whatever the guy says, you're just out, you know. Oh well. Your answer because he's just fucking huge. I don't know, man. In any case, man, he was uh he was great to be around. My he was great to be around. Was, uh, were you guys, I'm assuming you were at the show. Remember, so we did the joint in Vegas. 
and uh charlie had the sound guys put acdc on and it was it was like the loudest thing i've ever heard in my fucking life that wasn't vegas that was florida really it was the uh the, the hard rock in orlando it was so fucking loud oh is that where charlie was sitting in the middle of the arena for it was listening listen to the PA. Yeah, it's not the arena, right? Randy Willie, God love that guy, right? Oh, Remember God. Randy? Oh my God. Yeah, it, we had ten columns of Prism PA, right? Well, actually, we had Jesus sixteen is what we carry typically, but Randy uh, hung ten in the Hard Rock in Orlando, and we stacked them like you know a couple of rows of subs, and then PA to the ceiling. It was like the two biggest stereo speakers you could imagine. <laughs> But nobody knew whether we could run it at full tilt because of the electrical service. The, the house was really yeah, nervous. I remember, I remember them talking, yeah, yeah. Right. So Randy got on the floor and he put ACDC. I think it was Hell's Bells, right? So it was like kind of. But even that first, that first gong was like enough to split a body in half. <laughs> It was the lot. You're right. It, it was the loudest thing I think I've ever experienced. That much PA in that, you know, 2,500, 3,000 seat room, whatever it is. It was, yeah, gargantuan. Like everything. There's glasses falling off the bar. There's just people screaming. It was amazing. Uh, to, Remember the security that, guys coming in like, what the fuck is going on here? And a bunch of us looking like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and Charlie, Charlie's comment was, nothing like a great PA with a three-piece rock band and a giant PA like this. Yeah. It was just yeah. parting hair. <laughs> All right, let's take a step back. So um, I kind of know how you got into the industry, Frank. It was, it was very interesting, though. So I, Maxie, are you aware how Frank got going? uh no i don't think so no <laughs> you want to give us the quick version and the max yeah i don't know how you got going so I'm yeah yeah it. i cheated. yeah i want to hear how max got into this let, let, let me hear that one first <laughs> mine, mine might be tame by comparison <laughs> <laughs> mine was all in school i was uh i was in marching band in the uh, eighth and ninth grade and What'd you i play? fell over into uh, uh i was in the i was a marching band from the eighth grade to the senior yeah what did you then, play in the band i was a drummer drummer i was tri-top player yep cool first chair tri-top player but i was never the cool drum kit guy and my buddy was uh, a really really cool drum kit guy so i started hanging around the stage band and started plugging in cables and the band director asked me to hey if i wanted to try running sound i didn't know what the fuck i was doing and here i am running four hundred thousand dollar consoles 40 years later still <laughs> not knowing what the fuck he's I doing i don't know what the fuck i'm doing <laughs> Remember when I used to leave shit behind it and, and then um, I was scared. I didn't want to get fired. So I would just take everything. So I would take all the sound shit. I would take everything. I just remember Max is saying to me, this is not our shit. <laughs> you know, We'd get to the truck house. and it would like, dude, this is not ours. No, it needs to go back. <laughs> yeah. Somebody give this back to the house guy. He's going to be upset. He's going to be really pissed off. <laughs> no, that's not our mic stands. <laughs> so what was your first gig? So you're in high school. You're helping out with the audio and whatever else on the stage. Stage band, and that rolled out of that, out of grad graduating. And I started uh, DJing gigs after that. And I started my own sound company. Had that till 94. And started making those connections with uh, National Acts, uh, the uh, uh, Lillian Acts, King's X, Zebra, and the Neville Brothers. Doing those cool gigs and got in with that that thing in 94 i got in motley crew pearl jam uh king's x and just never looked back after that well, dude started rolling with it you know i made a joke but did you really pack in the, the lighting company because you wanted to tour or why did you why did you switch up i had sound and lighting back then so i was kind of you know back then it's in going into small clubs and stuff like that if you didn't know sound and lighting it just it was a real pain in the ass to deal and i had two 24 foot trucks and uh, just pull up at a club and just mow it. In fact, that's how I met Mo Keith Winhorst on Mixes Front House of Journey. And he would be just peeling the paint and the dust off the ceiling with my old PA system back then. That was back in 84, 85, 86, way back. Yeah. Did we you talked know Dave about that Rapp back then, just out of interest or say again. Did you know Dave Rat back then or no? I met Dave Rat probably 89, 90 back then. Yep. Cause I was starting to, I was starting to travel all over the U S by then. 
because I talked to him recently, you know, and he he would do like black flag shows way back in the day, which was just so cool to to me. That's so neat, you know. And, yeah, and some of the stuff he did was like flat out dangerous because they were doing shows in buildings with like no electricity. So he's climbing, you know, some of the stories I've heard from the older cats that knew him then, it was that he would just he he just tap into a power pull out out the street <laughs> or some utility. Yeah, he was he was crazy. That you sounds know, that's like not, Dave Rat right there. That sounds like Dave Rat for sure. Yeah, any anything to get a gig going, right? That was that was yeah, that was yeah, how it worked back then. Who was oh, right? Yeah. We didn't walk into buildings with an electrician. It was like here's uh, some bear tails and a, a a range plug. You can break the panel off and tie it into that. So who hired you, Frank? <laughs> Well, I was, a, I was a musician, right? I started off playing after high school. I wanted to play. I wanted to go to, to school and be a musician. And uh, it was no money. And I, and I mean, the, the caliber of players around Boston, Rhode Island, everything was just way out of my league. So I started uh, working on the other side of the desk, you know, and um, I just learned doing it. Um, I didn't, I already had like, I was into music. I knew how to operate a small mixing console. Um, we had been recording demos, right, in a rehearsal room. So recording and playback and mixing was kind of like, it became a thing. Um, but the whole PA thing wasn't. It was uh, somebody had to teach me how to put it together, why things worked the way they did. And then I just started working in clubs, but I didn't own anything. I worked for a guy named Dennis Verducci in Rhode Island. And then it got to the point where like, well, this is as good as it gets here. I got to go. I got to get out of here. Yeah, But, but getting out of here to where? Uh, your, poor, your mom dropped you off at the first gig or something. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a... That's a mom that's pulls a, up and kicks him out the side door. <laughs> well, not quite. So the the first gig after like, you know, I was I was rehearsing with a band in the uh, in Dennis's rehearsal studios. And I was at home on a Friday night, you know, I'm 15 years old. I was already already playing and like with other guys that, you know, they were older than me. So he calls me and says, hey, can you go work for me tonight at this club? And I don't, rem I don't remember the name of it, but it was in the airport plaza in Warwick, Rhode Island. And it was all dance bands at that point, you know, top 40 dance, top 40 rock bands. That was pretty much it. Um, so I said, yeah, no, I don't know how to do any of that. He's like, don't worry, it's all set up already. You just got to go sit in a chair behind the desk and, and move faders around. If the voice comes up or it's too, you know, just push a fader up and down. It's all labeled, everything's on. They played last night, so everything should be pretty much set. All you got to do is just, you know, push things up and down. That's all. Okay. So I have to ask my mother for a ride. And he's like, are you kidding? I'm like, I don't have a driver's license. Like you, you see me, you see her driving me to band practice. I don't have a license. So she's like, bike. yeah, that was, yeah, not down the highway. That wasn't. Happening. So I said, I don't think my mother's going to let me. You know, that was really where it was. At. I don't think my mother's going to let me. So he said, can I talk to her? And I, I put my mother on the phone with him. The two of them worked it out. My mother got her coat. And we drove down and then the owner of the place came out with a bouncer and they were like sideways, like you, you're a kid. You can't come in here. Like, well, I'm, I'm pretty much all you got tonight. So they sat me down with a bouncer and he uh, made sure nobody gave me drinks or I didn't go drink. And oh. I sat and, and did the show like that. I just sat there. For, I don't remember how long, three, four hours until closing two in the morning. Fucking drinks. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, there was like, you know, it's the it's the 80s. It's all these women dancing all, you know, this is when women got dressed up to go out. It was an event every Friday night, right? It was fun. <laughs> well, whatever. I'm just saying that like they still do, dude. They just don't do it for us. <laughs> that's what that's what he's so right there. He's yeah, right. it's not for us. But yeah, I was like, how how is that gonna go anywhere else? Like, how could you not be like, yeah. This is what I want to do every night until I retire from life. And uh, I stayed with it. I went to school and got a, a degree in electronics from New England Tech right after that. Then I went to Full Sail and then I drove to Texas and started working for whoever would hire us. Bernard Brown uh, and anybody, literally anybody that would hire us in, in Dallas, you know, in 92, 93. 
we went and worked. For oh, you were in Dallas? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to go. I wanted to. So you hooked up with Shoko. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was a great time. We lived like and animals, you, you know. When you met Maxie? <laughs> no, I didn't meet Maxie until the beginning of this, the STP tour. Yep, so you that's were right. working for Godsmack, though? I mean, honestly, I'm bad. I don't remember. So how... I remember Maxi because Maxi helped me out like a shitload because I didn't. Know well, <laughs> I I was the monitor system engineer on the SCP tour. Yeah, it was and, uh, it Family was Values, I think, something like that. Yeah, Family Values tour, wasn't it? Uh, no, no, it wasn't because it was Family Values was like Corn, STP, Lincoln Park. It was a different. It was a, it was either after, after it, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, after yeah. it or before it. But uh, we started at the Spectrum, remember, in Philadelphia? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we we set up all the gear. We had everything up. Everybody had line checked. We had Richie Mazetta playing. Uh, as a, he was a guitar tech. We had Jason. Oh, God. Jason Stock, Stockwell. Stock. Jason Stockwell taking care of basses. Yep. And yes. McGee. Doing <laughs> drums. McGee like doing drums. Oh. And uh, that was it. And then... We were looking around and I asked Maxie, when's the band going to sound check? And he's like, they don't sound check. I'm like, we're starting a tour like tomorrow. He's like, yeah, no, we're just going to do line check. The band will come in. We get it during the beginning of like the band's line, which I, I love and I use over and over again to this day was we know the songs. You guys know the equipment. Just do what you do. We'll be fine. Yeah. And they, well, they sure enough, man. Sure. I remember they would do a sound check if someone was going to record it. So it was like it was bullshit. It, it was exactly, bad. yeah. Remember, yeah. <clears throat> Frank's remembers so much of this stuff with STP, and I'm in man. I guess me getting older, I can't remember the gigs. He's nailing it. He brings a lot of it back now. Frank's <laughs> great with it. It's amazing when I called him uh, before I was messing around with my book. His memory was incredible, man. That's why I've, 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 I've written a lot of this down. Yeah. Like a lot, a lot of this is written. In, in other places right so it's fun like when somebody asks me you know it's happened a few times this past year i go revert back to some of my old notes you know and then like there's some stuff you can talk about there's some stuff you can't Did you when do i don't need to before this one because this is fucking important frank well it, when i don't need to work <laughs> anymore everybody's going down <laughs> oh my gosh yeah <clears throat> Sorry, no man. it's Here's a no, it's, for you guys. it's been awesome, right? <clears throat> I think it's been fun. All right, so you were doing uh you were mixing monitors on STP. So who was doing monitors on Godsmack? Uh Tony was there before me, and then I came in and took uh and I replaced Tony on Godsmack. Tony uh what was Tony's last name? No, that was uh Tony Pieris was mixing yep. in front of the house. Yeah. He was, uh, and I slid in, uh, slid in. That something happened there, and then you replaced him. That was how that happened. It yeah. was uh, the and middle of the Metallica the tour. <laughs> yep, that's right. the monitors. Yep, correct. So you realize the only people who are going to watch this is going to be roadies. So the more names we mention, the better chance we have of people actually watching this shit. <laughs> <laughs> we're making, we're making an effort here. The roadies are sitting on the edge of their seat, wondering who's going to get burnt next. Tell that. <laughs> you know what's cool so this guy gave I, I was talking to him and he he worked for death row records and i brought him on uh, my little show here to to shoot the shit and uh <coughs> he, he worked for ruthless Records, uh, which was easy easy label and he's like you know i did air supply in 1980 i'm like, well, that's cool that's cool he goes yeah the sound guy his name was davy kirkwood and oh my like, oh, gosh hold on hold davy on. I'm kirkwood like, i'm like you know davy kirkwood he goes yeah dude in 1980 we did air supply we did it for three years and i was like okay you're coming on my show <laughs> and uh <laughs> we talked about we talked a little bit about davy but man that guy was the shit he's like that he's guy can do some good cur go he curse like a sailor oh my oh, gosh God, and the guy was like you know the pride he was just always so fucking drunk i'm like yeah well, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was good all right, so question that's a bit of fun. So what's the tour you've done? I think I know Maxie's answer, and I might be wrong. What's the tour you've done where you've replaced the largest quantity of sound guys before you? Oh, that'd be Luke. Maxie? I'm trying. Well, it's <laughs> I'm a monitor guy. Frank's the front house guy. You know, it's like a revolving door in monitor world. <laughs> oh, <my Yeah>. <laughs> I'm 
I'm trying. Fired. I remember. I remember. Uh, what was that? Well, well maybe. I'm, I'm trying to think what tour it was. I walked out into the. Uh, it was. Uh, oh, it's Megadeth. And I walked out into the lobby and I saw Scotty Rinkowski in there. I was like, dude, what do you do? Oh, never mind. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm gonna have to say. I'm, I'm gonna have to rescind that answer. It was Godsmack during the Pantera transition. That was that was a bad one. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the second year of Ozfest, so 2000, Pantera is opening oh, for Oz. That's when it's fun. Yeah, it was out of hand, right? But they, I had been mixing monitors for them uh, for about three quarters of a year at that point, and we went back onto Ozfest. So. Um, the Godsmack guys decided they needed to have their own monitor mixer because they were doing shows on days off and they needed a guy. And I was not allowed to go because I was still working for Shoko, still, you know, Claire Brothers, Shoko, whatever. And so I was a company guy and I had to be with the production and they refused. They were like, You're, he's not going anywhere. We won't get him in time for load in again. So they got their own guy. He came in and uh flailed you know to be honest with you he flailed <laughs> and then the Ozfest ended and we had to go over to europe with pantera it was the uh oh, jesus whatever record it was doesn't matter so we were in europe for a good three months and i was like out of hand i was watching people like face plant just fetal alcohol syndrome drunk completely every day and that wasn't the band that was like their guests just random people that would show up and try and hang with them, right so it was a party all the time around oh, pantera Ozfest, it was huge. yeah so oh, the tour ends my liver is like begging for mercy i get on the plane to go back to uh go back to new york and in the airport um i go to uh get a cab to go over to from uh kennedy to LaGuardia to take the flight home. And in the phone call, ML Procise calls me. Hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm in a car going over to LaGuardia. I'm going home. I just came back from, uh, I think France. And he said, turn around, go back to Kennedy airport. You got to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> and I, I said, why am I going to Las Vegas? He said, you got to go mix uh, a Godsmack show tomorrow at, uh, Thomas and Mack Stadium. And I said, I, I'm didn't they get a guy? Didn't you get him a guy? And he barks at me. I got him nine guys, was what he said to me. I got him nine guys. And it was, always has a backup. <laughs> yeah. And they were all getting fired one after the other. And when I, the story I heard, you know, the next day when I got met the production manager, you know, he picked me up at the airport and I was like, what, what went on out here? I'm like, how, how bad can it be? He's like, dude, you have no idea what's going on and uh then i walked up and uh it was for it was way early in the morning i'm on a festival console like no idea what i'm about to do it just doesn't matter just go do what you do and uh one of the guitar techs terry wheeling comes in and i was like terry how's it going he's like oh a lot better now that you're back dude i'm like what happened he goes they installed an ejector bunk where a monitor engineer sleeps i'm like what are you talking about he goes dude we went through nine guys Nine guys. One guy got fired before he even touched the console. Another guy got fired between sound check and the show. We had a couple of guys for like two or three days. They were awful. Yeah, and then they found out you were home. So you're here. They and were, uh, the, you, you had met those guys or? No, no. I have no idea who any of the nine were. I, I, I can't, I can't even imagine well, no, who could the have band, been. The band knew you already. Well, I'd already been with with them. I'd started in 99. This was like late 2000. You know, they had they had I had to go somewhere else. I had to go do Pantera. They overlapped. So the band and they needed to get somebody to take care of their stuff. But everybody they got maybe they were getting rid of all those guys. So they get your ass back. <laughs> well, whatever it is, I'm thankful for it because it was a long 13 years. You know, it was a, a good 13 years. I mean, that's a lot longer than most monitor engineers last anywhere. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah you went monitors to front house because you were on front house when I was there doing monitors. Yeah, that's when I slid. It was during the Metallica tour. 
Um, Tony retired. Their, their former front of house guy retired. I slid into that chair. We called Maxie to come in and take over monitors and off we went. We had, we had like 14 days in a row of gigs, the acoustic Ooh. show, the regular yeah. show. It was just, it was a beat down. It really was a beating. That was another year of sustained beating of constantly gigging, constantly gigging. <clears throat> so Maxie, I thought you were going to say Guns N' Roses. I, I really did. But well, you know what? Uh, it's, I was his 52nd monitor engineer. <laughs> good I stated I was there 02, 03, 06, and then uh, then I got uh, replaced. So I did the first run with Mike Adams, and then the second 02, 03 with Mike Adams, and then that we were on that was just as the digital world was coming out, and me and Mike were on. Uh, uh, we were on uh, 3Ks, Heritage 3000s. And then, uh, in fact, we had a 24 by 18 rolling riser because we were carrying our own stage and everything then. And uh, then uh, 16 was Andy, um, Andy, German Andy. Um, and Andy doing, Ebert. Andy Ebert, yeah. Andy was doing the band and I was doing, um, I was doing Axel. And man, yeah. I'll be damned, I went and uh, Taurus calls me one night and he goes, Hey man, uh, we were in Las Vegas doing this gig, and he's like, "Hey man, I'm up here in Axel Suite. Come up here. We're up here bowling." I'm like, "Okay, sure, I'll go up there." What I did, I partied with the boss. Big mistake. Big mistake. After that, it fucking went downhill. Yep. Don't ever go party with your boss. Not a good thing. Well, yeah, especially, especially as a modern engineer, it's not good. It's never a good thing. Never a good thing. After that, it was every night. He was on me every night. I think I lasted about another month, and then I was glad to leave because I left and went straight to uh, Allison Chains right after that. I went Friday to Friday with guns to over to Allison Chains. Mike and oh, Asbury. how good was that? Yeah, how that good? Was, that was going from that was going from a train wreck to like, what? Where is this band? Where is this gig band at? Yeah, it was crazy. On guns, crazy, just partied bro. all the time. Oh yeah, that was oh that was the that's back when it was Axel and Friends. It wasn't Guns N' Roses. It was Axel and Friends band. Yeah, that uh, was that was good times though. They were a good band. Don't get me wrong. That was a good band, but uh, yeah, it wasn't. You got good. Bucket. Well, I don't know. Was who was a guitar? Bucket was there on the Bucket was on the first on the first oh two oh three, and then they changed over to who was the the uh, the new guitar player. Uh, they went through several of them. Yeah. Um, before from 03 over to 06. Fortis, you had uh, Fortis and you had uh, uh, Tommy was playing bass. Uh, Tommy, I think, stayed the whole time throughout that. I think, yep. And then uh, keyboards was a uh, what's his uh, original keyboard, Izzy. Player. yep. All right, on. this is this is turning into an ad for memory. No, it's getting like, nobody, no, yeah. nobody knows anything. Uh -oh. <laughs> I was on. Back in 82, there was a Digitron Effectron. <laughs> <laughs> and then they brought video. Then they yeah. brought video. So, yeah. so why Megadeth? Why why did you go why did they go through so many dudes on Megadeth? Uh Dave Mustaine's just the worst the worst. He was just the hardest. You know, I just ran into him. That was funny. Um, I was on three days. With your crazy. car? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three Days Grace, I was on Three Days Grace, and uh, Megadeth was uh, out on that same run with Five Finger, and I ran into him. He's, he was just the nicest person <laughs> to be such the bitchy person. <clears throat> and, you know, he's been having problems with his vocals, so I'm not going to sit here and dog on him. So I like him. He's, yeah, he wasn't that bad. Just he's definitely his own guy. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's his own guy. He's He doesn't follow the crowd. He doesn't care what somebody else's opinion of him is. He he really is like that. Um, and then the same thing is like Dave Ellison is pretty much the same guy. He goes through life, but they're two totally different personalities with the same thing. We just do what we do. And that's that love us or hate us. So it was, it was, it was a little bit difficult with the, with that. So what about fucking the sex pistols, dude? That must've been brutal. No, I, yeah, yeah. Worst thing ever. You know, it's, I'm, I'm lying. It was phenomenal. It was totally phenomenal. I, I had already gained a reputation as a dude who dealt with pests, you know, for lack of a better term. I had already been through uh, Iggy Pop. I had already been through, you know, the Godsmack early years where they were destroying stuff. You know, it was there was some violence, right? And it got around. Like I could handle it. I didn't, 
I didn't fold. I didn't cry. I didn't call everybody. Like, it's just, yeah, whatever. He'll wake up tomorrow and I'll either still have a job or he'll be sober and forget what happened today. Right. You just go through it like that. But the sex pistols was like last minute and it was Hootsie and uh, rooster and myself. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah. we got called and it was ML again. Hey, listen, we have this thing going down. It's about six weeks we need you to go out and mix monitors for the sex pistols. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. He said, here, it's going to be rough. It's going to be off. These guys drink, they fight. Um, it's going to be trouble. Can you deal with it? Yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> we got out there and it was them and uh, dropkick Murphy's. Oh, right. Oh, so wow. the, was there in front of house, obviously then. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the first day we're in Boston at the Fleet Bank Center Pavilion on the, the, the harbor. No band, no sound check. We just, you know, Hootsie and I came up with an input list. It took about 10 minutes. It was all of 17 microphones. It was nothing. It was a, <laughs> yeah. no, no joke, right? It was nothing on stage. We wanted to do this as stripped down and, and punk rock as we could do it so how as many engineers. This is normal because I, I don't know. Well, what was STP's input list, Max? 40? Um, yeah, and it was so simple. I mean, it was, it started simple, and then it got more, it got, you know, it, it grew as we went on. But a three-piece band, it was, it was so simple, you know? It was so, yeah. so simple. I mean, like, yeah, Godsmack with two drum sets and, and all that, you know, you're looking at 70, 80 channels. Sex Pistols was literally 17, and channel 17 was the spare vocal mic. So he really, the whole show is on 16 channels and uh, they never sound checked. They came in um, the first day, the drummer couldn't get into the States. He was held up at customs at Logan airport, like 10 minutes from the gig. And they said, yeah, we don't know if we're going to gig tonight. You know, he, they might turn him around, send him back to England. I said, you got backline guys that want to come up here. And John Rotten looked at me because nobody goes on our stage mate, except us. You ever got to come out there to fix anything? make sure I don't see you because you're fair game at that point. It's like, okay. So there's that. So first band goes on, second band goes on. They finish. All of a sudden I've got a dead console, just a blank zeroed out console. And I'm, you know, there's nothing. We're literally spinning and throwing up mixes right there as the band walks on stage. Like we had nothing. And uh, that was how the first gig went. They were like, you know, we did a sound check in 77. We ain't doing another one. That's that's it. And they don't want anybody on stage. It was really, really bizarre way to start a tour. But we got through the first night and uh, we started moving down the road. And there was, you know, it was awesome. Once once we hit like the second or third show, there was nothing to do. Just turn it on and let them rip. And they were awesome. But we didn't tell the office that. You know, when they call, hey, how's it going out there? Oh, man, it's complicated. Rough. It's, it's rough. complicated. It's rough. Rough. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Fucking English guys with their crumpets and shit. They're getting all angry with us. No, oh, Rotten Rotten was like fully himself. You know, fully himself. And, and Max, I don't want to take up like all the time here, but there is one story about us going to do a, tele a television shoot in L.A. We can get and, uh, whatever. Don't feel it. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so the the tour is over, and we've seen them do it all, right? We've been, we've been everywhere, and uh, we literally started in Boston, ending in Los Angeles, and we're supposed to do a TV show the night before the tour ends, and uh, we get there, and we've been told the stagehands will not put our gear on stage. The band won't do the show unless we use our gear. Would you guys want to do it? Yeah, no problem. We're going to give you some extra wedge. You guys put it together. And we literally had to think about, can can the five of us pick up that XL4? <laughs> She's got it <laughs> from the house. When it right? takes like six or seven people to do that. Yeah, that, well, was, that was the question. Like, can right we there. physically pick this thing up? Everything else we could do. That's the board, right? It's the board. Yeah, yeah, about 1,200 pounds. And yeah, right? every bit of 1,200 pounds. <laughs> so, uh, we're like, this is really the only thing. If that doesn't happen, then we're dead in the water. <laughs> so we managed to get the thing up golden. We're in. The stagehands are watching us the whole day. 
they're just sitting there like twiddling their thumbs and wobbling around and just yucking it up. And uh, comes one o'clock in the afternoon, the house broadcast audio mixer comes outside and we, we've, you know, known each other for a little while. And he, and he says, Frank, I understand your man, Johnny, doesn't sound check. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't sound check, man. Well, here's, here's what's going to happen tonight. I don't mix bands on TV that don't sound check. So when the show starts, I'll start pushing up faders, kick, the snare, hi-hat, whatever, until we get to the end. And I might have a serviceable mix by the end of the song. I was like, that's great, but let me let you in on a secret. When the show starts and there's nothing going to broadcast, the PA is going to be working out here. The monitoring is going to be working out here. If the TV's not working, nobody's coming to bother us. Like, I don't know who you're telling, like, that we might care. It's not my problem. Like, what you heard from us giving you a line check is more than we ever got for the first day we're doing this. So I think maybe, you know, might want to calm down a bit here. So know, that it's the fucking sex pistol. Did he think it was? Uh, no, I, don't I don't know, know, but but he came out after me and he had How all like had his, push some faders. <laughs> yeah, whatever, right? Um, you can figure it out. You've done this long enough. And um, a, a couple hours later, Rotten shows up, and he he walks out. Right, where's the backdrop? And the lighting guy Kenny's like, you know, we, we can't use it because the director. Right, never mind. And he walks into the building and his security guard is like a, a mini me version of him. Swear to God, right? He's got this little English guy who's like three quarters his size who wears the same kind of getups because Rotten's like a dapper dresser, right? He, he likes to be dressed up. So he goes into the building. Like five minutes later, he comes walking back out again, gets on his bus and it drives away. And uh, the tour manager comes out and he's like smoking a cigarette and he's just, completely not interested in anything. I said, hey, what happened? He goes, well, he walked in, uh, asked who's in charge of this, and was was brought the person and told them, listen, I don't give a shit about being on TV. I ain't got a new album to promote. And the tour is over tomorrow. Uh, you don't do it my way. We don't do it at all. I'll see you later. And he literally, he was on his way back to the hotel telling everybody at the show, like, beat it. I'm not, I'm not doing anything the way any of you want us to do it. We're doing it our way. And sure enough, they had to call him. We thought we were just musical guests that night. Well, he was, he was on panel. So that was like a good 15 minutes they were going to lose of the show without a replacement that late in the day. So we wound up going to a TV show telling everybody, you know, this is you're gonna have to deal with us today we're not dealing with you and man every time i've been back there since is just painful but that very first time we managed to get one over on everybody else okay. ah. <laughs> oh, good yeah yeah oh, oh man so you and johnny <laughs> ron would just chat and he wouldn't rip your fucking head off no, he was, he was a great guy. He really was. I don't, I don't know the guy. Like I said, I don't become pals with anybody, sure. but he seemed to be an all right guy. Jones, he was awesome. Steve Jones, you know, yeah. another great guy. Had no guitar deal. Like his guitar tech broke the truss rod in a guitar the first or second day. They fired him. And then they put it out on the internet. Like, hey, Jones, he needs a guitar for the gig. So kids would show up to the meet and greets well meet and greet it was just like you know they would just show up to whatever parking lot of the club we were in with, with guitar guitars party. yeah and he would like see so bring hey all you come inside and he would one by one go through the cases and he would pick out a guitar that he was going to play that night and he would play if it was a nice one he would play it as the main and use the one he had as a backup and if it was you know a, de depending where we were and somebody had a good guitar and he went through the whole tour like that and he'd give the guitar back then to the kids. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he didn't keep anything. He'd give them, yeah, give them back the guitar. It was awesome. They were so, they they totally were, it was punk rock. It was punk rock, but it was like, you know, middle-aged punk rock. They weren't that 1977, 78 spit on me kind of vibe. I'm just it like was, a Johnny Rotten addict. Like, he did this, uh, he did this panel. He was with, uh, I don't know, he, was with uh, Henry Rollins and there was a there's a bunch of guys on the panel and he's just he's real drunk 
And he's such an asshole. If you don't laugh in that like 30, 40 minutes of panel, there's something wrong with you. It's amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> if you re- I, I've oh, never dude, seen oh, him yeah. be anybody, like that. Anybody, you know, anybody, anybody says anything, he just rips them up. There's one of the guys <laughs> from the Ramones on there and the guy, and he keeps picking. It's a panel of dudes. And at the end is some lady who I, I didn't know. I don't know who she is. And uh, at the end, he goes, I mean, who the fuck are you anyway? You're some toff or something. I think he said, who are you? Why are you even here? So then the Ramones guy's like, hey, all right, take it easy, take it easy. And he goes, you're not even on any of the fucking Ramones albums that matter. You're, be, you're a worthless piece of shit. I mean, it was gnarly. Oh, my was, God. Oh, it's, it's great. <laughs> I mean, it's really, really good. And then Rollins doesn't talk. You know, and Rollins, he talks a lot. He doesn't say shit the whole time. He's just laughing away because at the end of the day, it's fucking Johnny Rotten, man. <laughs> you know, it's pretty cool. All right, so Maxie, we're gonna move to you because uh, Frank needs a lighting tech there with his light in the background. Yeah, his bad back lighting's killing me back there. <laughs> Is it? Frank. Oh, don't move your head. Oh, Just stay there. It looks like he's on a Muppet video, doesn't he? Oh, there he goes. There we go. Yeah. So Max, why didn't you asshole say this an hour ago? Because no, we we're getting pinned. Joke, yeah, we were right? getting pinned by the back lighting. My joke was amazing. <laughs> So Your Maxie, joke. I, I I feel like I had a uh, like you had a really strong respect for Marilyn Manson. I, I feel like you had a really good connection with that guy. Am I out of my mind or am I totally right hitting the money? You know what? It's, uh, it's I started with him in the clubs, and I, I did. I, it's funny you, you uh, say this. I did this side of the tour, and Bruce Dance did this side of the tour. <laughs> so it was like going up and over the hill, and. Uh, Charlie Hernandez pulled me from uh, pulled me from Manson over to Stuntable Pilots on Ozfest at that, and uh, yeah, I, I did the clubs. Me and Garrett Rents. Garrett calls me one night. He goes, "Hey man, I got this uh, this band. You got to you got to run monitors for. They're having they're going through monitor guys." And I'm like, "What?" And he sends me a video of this, and I'm just like, "Dude, the guy's pissing on a park end." I'm not going to work for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was just sitting there going, "Are you crazy?" Well. In about three days after that, I was working for him, and I worked for him uh, almost almost ten years. Uh, Bruce beat me by a year, or a year and a half, I think it was. And uh, yep, I did some I had some really good gigs with him, and I just let it go through one side of the ear and out the other. I didn't take it personal, you know. The guy wants a thousand roses on stage where you are. I don't care. I just make it happen. Just make the guy happen. You know, it wasn't that bad. Uh, it, is it wasn't as bad as a lot of people think it was. Being a monitor guy, Frank will, Frank will vouch for this, man. You let this stuff personally get to you, bro, you won't, you won't make it. Just, yeah. just go, with the, go with the flow, man. Make it happen. Do what you do. The guys who can stay there for a long time and make a career out of it, you know, you're working alongside artists, you know, and you're not a band member. So you don't, you, you have to be <clears throat> as involved as a band member, but with none of the respect, you yep. know, for, for the worst of with none of the respect they'll they'll call you things that like you know you would you would be in fist fights had it happen in public with anybody else right they'll say things they'll they'll physically throw things things that happen and uh you just let it go otherwise you're gonna get an ulcer or you get fired i mean there's a limit you know I've reached my limit a couple of times. You know, we all have. We all have had that. We've all had yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been moments where it's been like, listen, you know, you're about to cross a line here, and I don't really care who you are, right? You, you, you need to reel it in. And uh, for the most part, even they, the worst of the worst, will, will, will step back. It's the ones that don't, and it's only been one in my entire career. And I just literally turned off the rig and walked off. And that was the end of it. That, that was how I fixed it. Listen, you, know you, you going huh? from Manson, going from Manson over to uh to Scott and being on Ozfest through all those years. And Frank was around there because it was the Pantera, uh uh, I think it was Pantera typo negative, Merrill Manson uh static egg. There was a bunch of those really, really good bands on there. And yeah, Charlie, Charlie comes over one day and he puts his hand on my shoulder. And I'm having a really hard day with Manson. And he goes, hey, man, why don't you come for work for a, rock, a real rock band on a day off with me? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, come work for STP for me and fly out with me. And me and Charlie were literally on, we'd have two or three days off on uh, Ozfest. And I would fly with Charlie to go do some Stone Pilot shows and fly back. Me and Charlie, we, I'd be exhausted. And I'm turning around, I've already done 12, 14, 15 days straight flying back and forth, back and forth. But 
I, when I, the day I met Scott, that guy never, uh, 16 years with Scott, that guy never yelled at me, never yelled at me. Yeah. He'd have nights that he didn't like monitors, but Scott would, he would never go off. And I've seen him peel monitor guys apart and I would walk up there and he just, me and him clicked. I never had any problems with him. So like Frank's saying here, you know, he didn't really buddy up with the band too much. I totally understand why. Yeah. Maxie, I kind of know you and you buddy up with the bands pretty tightly. Well, yeah. some I did, some I didn't. It would vary, you know, uh, of, of Manson, you know, it was just, part of the gig but uh me and i mean i got to be friends with scott and then i did not work for him for 10 years and then i came back out of the working for the hard rock live and he begged me to get back out on the road and that was when he had uh scott wyland and the wildabouts there and i uh, did those i think three last three years there and uh i i was i was clicking um scott was having his issues but uh it was it was a good gig i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say anything bad about him god bless his soul and uh, he was he was a good guy. He was a good boss. No, he's he I like hardest. Scott. Scott treated me fucking great. Yep. Always. He was always a good one. Always. Yeah. Never had anything. He was always really, really cool to me. Always. That guy is literally the first and only guy I got punched in the face over by an audience <laughs> member. Yeah. Oh, do you remember oh. that dumbass? He used to jump into the audience, right? Oh and, yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Now you guys all yeah, remember. Yeah. 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 Oh. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. First, first, the yeah. Him. First night he did it, right? Max, he slaps me with a, a SM58 wireless. He goes, "Go get him." Let me go get him. Go get him. Go get who? What are you nuts? He's like, if he drops that mic in the audience, he needs another one. Go out there. So I'm dressed like, you know, dirty roadie. <laughs> I go out there and I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm, I'm at him. I'm, and then there's Charlie. Charlie's holding him up. And there's Dan, Rigger Dan. And the two of them got him and it's all good and everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, this guy grabs a hold of me by the collar from behind and starts dragging me over backwards. So the first thing I do is throw the elbow, get off me, right? And the guy socks me one in the side of the head right over the eye. And I'm just like, you just cursing up a storm, you fucking dummy, get off of me. And he's still dragging me over backwards. Charlie's laughing, Dan's laughing, Scott's laughing. As they're watching me get dragged away. And uh, I go back and it's, it's over by this point. He goes back on stage, he keeps his mic with him. Very next gig, Dan came in, remember the shirts? Right, yeah. he had the shirts made. Sure. It was uh, STP bitch, bitch. Yeah. projecting yeah. strength, yeah. right? <laughs> and that was, that. and that was the security guy's clue, not not to beat the guy up. And Charlie's like, look at the guy's face, right? He showed my black guy to the <laughs> next bunch of security. This is he got punched by one of the security guys because they didn't know he's with him. So if you see any of us with those, you'll know who I am. <laughs> he said, he'll know who I am. But if you see anybody else wearing these shirts, they're one of us. He can't wear a lanyard in the crowd because they'll choke him with it. So that was how we did the rest of the tour. And it was, you know, it was great. People in the audience realized, like, oh, it's part of, part of the team. They, just, they left us alone at that point. So I yeah, I took Scott. one right in the face. I jumped in with Scott, I think only once. I don't remember how many times, maybe a couple times, but we had a talk. And the talk was, Rifkin, you're not fucking tough. Don't jump in the goddamn crowd with me because then I got to watch <laughs> and, you know, and you're making my life a lot harder. Stay on the yeah. fucking stage. Don't get off the stage again. I was like, okay, sorry, guy. Sorry, Scott. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, do you remember the marathon running sessions he used to do on the, the treadmill? With Dan, uh, I remember yeah. having Dan on his shoulders and Dan would run the whole fucking thing with him up there. Oh, uh, yeah. I remember that. Well, yeah. the treadmill was what kept Scott like at bed. Have to set it up every fucking day in his own little room so that he could. The guy would run miles and miles. Yeah, I, I don't. That was like ultra thon distances. He would he would run from morning to gig. He cared in my world. He cared about two things. It was the treadmill and the Laker game. Oh yeah, always the Lakers. I remember that. So I have Lakers, yeah. or he get pissed off. But uh, other than that, the guy was pretty easy to deal with. I miss him. He was a good guy. Oh, yeah, it was like that's... watching. It was like watching a modern Led Zeppelin. How good they were! They were just 
amazing. Talk about it, and I say, like, do you remember he would sing the Carpenters, and it was just fantastic, man. But he never, from what I remember, he never finished one of the Carpenters songs. But he would go into it. They'd either play Zeppelin, The Doors, or The Carpenters, depending on when they were having issues with shit. <clears throat> I loved the I loved the Carpenters still, but dude, hearing him sing half the song was awesome. That guy was amazing. Well, that band was one of the very few, less less than it one less than a single handful of bands where I can honestly say the first time I heard them that the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Yeah. It was that that intense, and he was just he was just better than everybody as a frontman performer. He was just you know light years. He was yeah. he gave everything out there. You know, you'd he be gave sitting- everything. You'd be mixing a show, dude, and they would be just, it'd be some nights, they were just killing it, and Jesus, I'd look down and my hair was standing straight up on my arms. That yeah. man, they, those guys definitely put it to the point. They were really, really good. I love, yeah, I love really the one he would do down. I love that song. Oh, yeah. Oh, fucking good. <laughs> you remember shooting the video for Meat Plow? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you remember that? And the, oh, you, how do you not remember this, dude? I walked into the production office. Charlie's on the phone. I need a white pony and a dwarf. No, <laughs> what? Yeah. I was about to say that. Yeah, I remember for yeah. the song "Sex right? and Violence." It wasn't. It was for the song "Sex and Violence." Sex and Violence. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and I played a. I played a chicken because Dean shot the video. Yeah. Well, that video didn't even make it to MTV because it was no. too. It was too much, right? They saw him like, we can't play this. This is like, who's a wardrobe lady dressed up as like the dirty nurse, right? She was like the S and M shit. Yeah, right. And then there was there was like a, an icon lamp in a in a, a boiler room. There was a midget who showed up with a black eye, right? Yeah, the midget. Yeah, Drunk right. Midget. He's in the shower with two girls. They're filming that. There's a there's a, a horse with projection on the side of it, and he's freaking out. He and then, like, it was it was bizarre. There was some unbelievably bizarre incidents. Were you in the that was like Charlie made the call. The call was so it was just so. I need a white pony. I need two women. They're gonna be. White. I walked in about something else completely, yeah. and that was what I heard. I literally literally turned. I didn't even turn around. I just back stepped and shut the door on my way out. I was like, I don't need, I don't know what's going on here. And sure enough, a little while later, the mother and daughter, they came from a farm somewhere in Wisconsin not with the trailer. They had a pony, a white pony they came in with. Then the, the little person, he came in black eye with, with a security shirt. Like he was security somewhere. He was on his way to work and decided to make some money from a casting call. It was the most bizarre, like those were the things that happened like regularly. Well, he kept puking and then Charlie got him some alcohol to get him drunk again so that the, he would stop with all the uh, puking. See, yeah. that's thinking. Yeah. Fucking right on that time right there. <laughs> he makes an alcohol, alcohol we'll fix that. Said, oh, Maxie. <laughs> yeah, just fix the problem, make it go away. Make it go away. <laughs> so, uh, to shift the tides here so you got to work with dolly parton which to me is like the absolute royalty of of music and i'd love to hear anything cool about dolly did she ever sing stairway to heaven on any of the shows you did no she uh once she uh once they formatted the show she uh um she rolls through the show it's the same show every night and i mean all the way down teleprompters telling her where to go and everything but i tell you what you you just brought up a really good point uh that was definitely the top female artist that i've ever worked for that lady does not that (laughs) frank will love this one her worst night doing monitors would be her coming at me doing this because the room was just so light and she's doing her hands like this because she was just lost she couldn't hear and she comes over and and after the show, I walk over, I said, you kind of lost there? And she goes, oh, don't worry about it. We'll get it tomorrow. And I just thought about all of the hard assholes that I worked through, all that to listen to her and go, oh, we'll get it tomorrow. Don't worry about it. We'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> That's the best right there, man. It can't get any better than that. She's a good lady. She's oh, a very she's good lady. so freaking cool. I know her yeah. version of Stairway to Heaven is incredible. Yeah. Incredible. <clears throat> 
right, so you know that one. that lady has 20 uh i i did not know that she has 2600 songs that are either she wrote uh that are either that made it to number one that either she did or that she wrote and somebody else did i never knew that i think she writes that's a lot of songs day. yeah that's a lot of songs it's a lot of songs but i think <laughs> i think i think i think but it's really remarkable man i mean and everybody you'll ever meet tells you how great she is uh, it's, it's a pretty commendable thing she's pretty neat My she's favorite. a big juncture she cuts up now i was getting a picture with her and uh it was going in the crew book and uh we were sitting there uh our camera guy sitting there going y'all guys hurry up we got 100 people uh, vip hurry up hurry up and so i sit there and he goes three two one oh two she pinched me on my eye oh pinched me on my eye <laughs> and so in the picture i'm going <laughs> and i went dolly she goes ah you know you liked it <laughs> so it's like yeah all right all right i did i won't lie i did i did like that <laughs> she's well, a good she's lady quick. you know I yeah that's what is she's did you ever meet her husband uh no he never comes to shows carl dean never comes to show and uh quick note here if he does does come to a show he buys his own ticket and he flies and he does not tell dolly really yes i am not lying he will come to a show and you'll never she he'll tell her a month later that he made a show he's just so low-key he's from the middle and, and just very laid back yep Oh, and uh, cool. you'll never know that he ever came to a show you know um uh her security guy is uh brian and brian's mom is dolly's sister so there's a lot of family that's always working around her too and a lot of her family runs um uh, uh dolly um does uh, oh, runs dolly world yep that's a lot of her family because i think it was 12 of them 12 brothers and sisters wow a lot oh no, yeah i knew that Yep, lots well, yeah, lots of. I mean, she grew up with nothing for real, like really yes. nothing. Yep. And she has her family home. She bought her family home from when she was a little kid. Yes. If you ever go into her new resort, uh, that's where we stand. We're up there doing the Dollywood gig. Um, if you're ever, um, if you ever do a gig up there, or if you ever uh, around and you stay at the resort, go downstairs to the bar and look at the bar, and it's a bunch of bottles done with sand but if you back up it's a big mural of the valley going up to her house and it's made with bottles and different sand and if you back up and look at it, it's beautiful unbelievable well, that's cool <clears throat> all right my favorite frank story i don't know if maxi knows it hoping you don't because it's freaking great and it was uh you're on tour with um chris cornell's band and audio slave audio, audio slave oh, wow. out of where you wouldn't shower oh that's sound garden sound garden thing <clears throat> yeah that, so that's that that when when he worked for sound garden that was about three three tours into my career um my first european run right, and leak while you tell this story because i'm dying <laughs> But I already, go, know, I already know. Why you're gonna go? While I'm gone. No, no, you need to stay, dude. You're the host. You you've totally done done yourself in here. <laughs> no, if you gotta if you gotta pee, go pee. Right, but um, you. yeah, listen, still, Matt. So Max, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, way back when the English and the Americans didn't get along as well as they do now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And our so, host leaves to go to pee. By the way. <laughs> yeah. So uh. So we were in, uh, Jesus, we were in London and we were meeting up with all the new guys, the guys coming together on the tour. And uh, this was on Soundgarden? Yeah, down on the upside. So we start there. Funny enough, right? I just found like the field book. I don't know if you could see it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this has, it's literally from that era where I used to take, uh, you used to have to, before we had system books and stuff, right? You had to write down all the stuff, how the cabinets were wired together and such. Oh, my. Oh, wow. Old so we school. Used to, before yeah, we had old school. Phones. Right? Here's like Linda Ronstadt stuff. Right? Oh, geez. Yeah. So this is, this book is from, uh, Jesus, 94, right? Uh, they're just uh, surveyor's field books. So is your daughter's great inheritance? No, this is for me. This will this this will be part of it later. But 
So we get to London. We're meeting up with all the crew, and the tour rigger is just a douchebag, just right out of the gate, douchebag. And uh, he starts in on you, you, you wanker, softy, all of it, right? He had like every single, I don't know, every single derogatory word for a young American crew member, all <laughs> at me, right? And I was touring with two seasoned veterans at, that I was, you know, teching for. And uh, he started his nonsense. You, you, you guys are not going to like this over here. It's not like America where you can eat McDonald's every day, and, you know, shower in a clean thing. It was like, yeah, whatever. And uh, his, his lighting cohorts decided that they were going to like get in on it. So they all started their bullshit. So we're riding the bus and we're going from London to like Switzerland, you know, to do a gig. That's the first gig. And then we're going to go right back to Barcelona to do a gig. So it, these are two really long bus rides back to back to back. And during the first bus ride, these guys decide to start chiming in like you soft. You're not going to be able to make it out here. You, you can't hang. It's like what exactly is the what do you think is going to happen out here that I can't deal with? And they said, well, the shower situation is definitely one. I was like, well, what's the problem? They're like, well, we're playing like old clubs in Europe, old theaters. They don't have running water in some of them. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. It's not a big deal. And they got like, you're going to crack, right? You'll be whining about this before anybody else. Like, okay, whatever. And they're like, I'll tell you what, we'll have a bet me. Your per diem against ours that we can go longer without a shower than you. And I was like, are you serious? They said, yeah. Yeah, we're serious. I'm like, huh, 35 bucks a day. There's three of them. There's one of me. I go, so so as the guy, you still got to put in per diem until the last guy's done, right? Yeah, yeah. If you're in the bet to start with, you're in until the end, whether you shower or not. I go, and you think I can't go as long as you? And they were like, no, it's never going to happen. Well, three days, five days, seven days, bang, there goes the first lighting guy. 10 are days changing, are you changing your shoes and socks i'm changing my socks i had to because otherwise i would have rotted my feet yeah exactly yeah that's a right. yeah, that's it. so uh we get to day 10 and the first lighting guy folds day 11 day 12 the next guy folds so i just keep going and it was another three days i think it was 14 or 15 days when the bus driver accosted me you know came in on the bus at night he was like you fucked up my bunk you fucked up the curtains the mattress the sheets everything i can't get the smell out of there it's never coming out i gotta throw all of that stuff away when we're done congratulations so then i would just aggravate him i would like walk into the back lounge and everybody would just be and I, by that point i don't even notice i smell anymore it's it's you know, I'm over. <laughs> that's so awesome yeah yeah i i got all their money i got all their money and that was the end days? of it. I mean, was the how many days of it? It was 15 days total. Woo! God bless. 15, 15 days of chain motor grease on my hands, of cigarette smoke from European clubs, of the smell of whatever came out of me at the same time. It was, I was awful. I was a dirty mess. But I didn't crack. Right? Oh, man. Oh, boy, right there. <laughs> So was the I bet those aware guys love eating their words. What, what's that? Was the band aware of them? I mean, they'd have to come over to you sometimes and be like, whoa. Yeah, well, the funny thing was, I don't think any of them cared. I honestly don't think any of them cared. They just <laughs> they, they just did their thing. We did ours. Um, another spectacular. That's, that's, again, one of the other instances where uh, you hear a band for the first time and you just, the hair stands up on your neck. They walked in uh, to the Barrowlands, which is a, a, a you know the gig, Maxi, right? It's upstairs in Glasgow on the third floor. It's yeah. the toughest local crew in the world. And they I've carry never... your cases, your heaviest rack. And those guys run around those squares going all the way to the top. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's, yeah. It's the, third, it's the third floor of like a warehouse type building. And on the third floor is this giant ballroom. <laughs> and uh lots of gigs there lots of historic gigs there and that was the first day of the tour it was like oh my god we're in for this i thought at that point i was like holy shit i don't think i am ready for europe this is bad yeah. but yeah they're the toughest dudes you'll ever see in the world it's a great gig 
And when you get like 5,000 Scottish kids all rocking at the same time, you know, it's, it's hard to be, so it's hard to, it's hard to be upset about that. To watch those guys carry an XL three all the way up those steps. Yeah. <laughs> I was impressed. I yeah. Was impressed. Yeah. Yeah. It was insane. Right. You could not get people to do that anymore. Germany got Germany crew guys the same way. I mean, they would just, those guys would just, they were solid, solid, solid. Do these country guys that you've been working for go overseas, Maxi? Um, I just, uh, in fact, I had jumped from five finger death, but ended we were just in the Eastern block. I flew home for about, about 32 hours, did a rehearsal with Tanya, one show and flew right back to Europe. And we were doing, we were on standby to do country fest over there. And March 9th, I flew home for the pandemic. Oh, no kidding. And a good old Tanya Tucker, she held it out to the end and, she did not want to cancel and the promoter canceled and she got paid in full. <laughs> Good for her. That's a lot. Oh, yeah. She held out. She's a pistol, man. She is a pistol. Right on. Yeah. All right. So I have a serious question. I think sometimes the guys on the stage get confused to be the actual people in the band. But the front of house guys are clearly not in the band because they're stuck in the audience. Does that bother you? <laughs> Does it bother me? <laughs> yeah. Did I just fail? That was a fail, huh? <laughs> All right. You want to hear my other one? Like, Have you been drinking? This is kind of <laughs> Ron Kroom, who's a lighting guy. He goes, <laughs> what was it? Why do sound guys only count to two? You know, one, two, one, two, check in one, two, one, two. Because you have to lift on three and sound guys don't do any work. <laughs> Yeah, that's the old one. <laughs> oh my god. Is this guy straight out of like 74? Like with the no, this dude is again they're yeah. the worst yeah. jokes ever. That's the old one. The hey, Ted one. Bible goes Ted Bible goes to seven. <laughs> the other one it was uh it was uh so a sound guy goes into the bar and then he has to leave. The sound guy would never leave the, the bar. And I'm kind of like what kind of fucking dude lighting guys are better than this, Ron? Give me a goddamn better joke, Ron. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. Where did you get your joke? Where, where, where do these jokes come from? What kind of people? You know what the worst part about being a lighting guy is? What do you got? They're never going to be sound guys. <laughs> That's That's a, yeah. That was an awful joke. That yeah. Was worse. That was worse than my one about being. Hey, I wore a oh my god! Shirt. Listen, if the guy's bothering shirt. us, he's clearly not taking care of his own stuff. Yeah, <laughs> what did the lighting guy use for his uh, birth control? The personality. <laughs> wow, that's brutal. Uh, that's that's on that's all right. Why do fans <laughs> say I'm going to see a rock show? They never say I'm going to listen to a rock show. Or they some say I'm going to hear it. listen. Uh, yeah. I'm going I've, I've never heard anybody say I'm going to go listen to a show ever. Exactly. Ever. ever. Yeah. That's because we're, we're more important. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's important. Listen, the only people important are the ones on stage actually doing the performance. The rest of us could all go away. What I do you know, is an art piece, Frank. <laughs> an art piece. Oh, for the love of God. Must be art. I don't yeah. get it. <laughs> for the love of God, really, please. <laughs> all right. What's some of the funniest shit that people have asked you in the audience? Like, can you ask if they can find my purse? Have you guys, what are, what are the, have you ever had some odd ones of like, can you help me with blah, 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 make an announcement? <laughs> they throw shit up there, then they want you to go find it on the stage. Hey, I threw a shoe up there. Can you find it? All load out. Yeah. You know how they, yeah. It's just like, really? Well, somebody, I, yeah. People would, on STP, they throw uh, their CDs and stuff and I'd, I'd grab them and I'd listen to them hoping that maybe I'd find somebody cool and they sucked. They always suck, man. Always, <laughs> I never heard no, On Marilyn Manson, it was good though. I mean, we had, we had some pretty crazy shit up there because Manson had this little barricade that went around his wedges and I, we started the loadout one night and I reached over and something ran across my hand and I pulled the wedge out and somebody had thrown a scorpion up on stage. Jesus. And it was my, yeah. it was it was up behind the wedges and I was going, are you joking me? And then another night, somebody threw a headless chicken up there. You know, it was, you would get the craziest Ozzy Osbourne shit. moment, what the fuck? Do you remember yeah. on, uh, do you remember STP where the guys were throwing the, uh, the needles on the stage? Oh yeah, yeah. I remember us, 
I remember Scott going off on a guy that had a shirt on that says, let's do heroin together. And Scott just went off on this guy. You ever been to prison, little boy? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he just ragged on the guy like, dude, that shit fucked me up. Yeah. And that was on his, that was when he was doing really well and he was uh, clean for a little while before he fell off the wagon. Yeah. So it was good. Yeah, I remember him cutting up with his kids. They were really small at that point. Yeah. <laughs> well, his son just did this. Uh, I'm sure Maxie heard it. Did you hear the song his son did? I I heard about that. Uh, well, no, what was the band that I just heard? It's uh, like uh, three, you know, seconds to 60. I, I don't know the name. I should know. I should have written it down. I heard that song. It's yeah. fucking great. He sounds like Scott, dude. It's oh, wow. <laughs> But I just read on. He's having some issues too. Hopefully, Mary can help him out. I don't know. But yeah, they kicked him out of the band for the time being. Hopefully, he figures out and comes back. But it was really, really good, man. He sounded, he sounded like a dad. I heard that. So, how old are those guys? They're all are they twenty or are they teens, late teens? I think they're high school guys. I mean, so remember, Mary was pregnant. So this was a two thousand. What we toured together in two thousand one, and she was yeah. pregnant with him. Yeah. I remember when she flew into Jackson and we had a, they, a, me and Hootsie flew back with the band in the jet and we landed in Jackson and I had lined up a cruiser. I lined up a cruiser boat for them and Robert walks over and he goes, dude, can you get me a fishing pole so I can go fishing? So I lined him up a jet ski and he went over the corner and he was just all about the catch, catching some fish and he went over the corner and he caught a bunch of fish i was he was i've never seen a rock star artist just he was just gleaming because he had caught a fish <laughs> that was a good day robert. yeah uh robert 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 yeah robert and uh mary flew into that gig there and uh, she she was well we had two days off and then we went on to atlanta we were coming from oh 311 had opened for us we were in uh i think kansas at some festival and it rained so hard i remember that we got on the jet i was like oh we're gonna fly this and took off in five minutes we we're out of the weather and on our way and uh, flew into jackson i was dating a doctor then <laughs> wow I know. Why didn't I marry the doctor? Yeah, Frank? The fuck that one. Why didn't I marry the doctor? <laughs> you didn't enjoy the prostate exams as near as much as she did. <laughs> <laughs> so who was you like bucket list guy that. that you guys worked for? Um, I mean, for me, for like looking at your lists, I mean, it's tough. But Frank, I'd be, I don't know, I'd be the, I'd be the Sex Pistols or Soundgarden. But I mean, who was your? Uh, who was your, are, are, do you even get phased? Is there anybody like, I can't believe I'm working for this guy. This is cool as fuck. I mean, is there anything? No, no, because it was always like, you keep your head down and do the job, right? Yeah, but it's still cool because you're listening to music that you like, you grew up on. I mean, what was the first album you bought? Let's put that, what was your first record? The, the, well, the first record I got was uh, Billy Joel, 52nd Street. That was the first record I got. He'd be fun to work for. I'm sure he can be a bit of a nightmare, but dude. No idea. No idea what he's like, um, but I have seen the show twice now, and it is unbelievable good. Billy Joel is, he's one of the guys like that come from the era of like, they've been doing it for so long. They wrote so many records that you forget how much stuff they do until you're sitting in, in it for two hours. You know, I just thought, cause I've been doing this memorabilia thing and I got, uh, I got some of Prince's set list that Prince wrote. And he switches the shit up but, but every night. It's completely yeah. different, dude. Yeah, I'd heard about that. Yeah, I'd it's heard about nuts. that. You're thinking like, I mean, from your guys' standpoint, is that chaos when you have to when you have to handle the songs or nah, whatever, you figure it out? No, nah. no, nah, you just do it. You, you, if you work for that kind of guy, you get in that mode. If you work for the guy who does the same thing every night, you do that. It, you, again, like we don't get to pick who we choose who we work for. We don't know what their habits are right max i mean yeah. Yeah. We, we don't we don't influence like their creative process and that's the you know the, as hard as it might be for us it's never going to be as hard as it is for the guitar techs you know especially if you got a band with multiple tunings and all of a sudden the set list flips around and how am i going to go from this song to this one you know they've got it way worse the only guy who's ever got it easy is the drum tech you know, he lives in an eight by eight world. Once this shit is up, that's the end of the day for him. <laughs> Guitar techs might have it a lot harder, 
I think after that, maybe, uh, you know, then, then we start getting involved. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's that bad for, for audio to, to have a guy who moves. To, it keeps you fresh too. Yeah. But did you, you know, guys ever work for one of those bands that like plays all night? I mean, I guess he would do like two, three sets in a day. They were telling me he, he literally the Metallica didn't. guys, man, they go and go and go. They do a long, super, super long set. Now he yeah. does two and a half hours. She does two and a half hours. I, you know what? I, I made this comment to Frank one time. He's always, dude, you never sit down. You never sit down. Cause I always stood up and just, and I think probably in the last 10 years, I actually sit in a chair and mix now because my feet and ankles can't take the concrete anymore. <clears throat> Standing I up. with gloves on because of uh, picking up those fucking icons. I think that's what it is, man. <laughs> but it works. I have no, uh, what do you call it? Uh, carpal tunnel at all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's pretty yeah, funny. Yeah. You watch me go to sleep. I got, I got a little hat because I'm fucking bald and I got my little gloves on. <laughs> I, I'm somehow I'm thinking like you know the 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 nightmare before Christmas. You're like, what the fuck are you wearing to bed? A hat, gloves? <laughs> yeah, cool. like a Tim Burton character creeping out exactly. of the box. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. A picture tonight. I'm gonna sing a picture, and they'll be like, ah, oh, it's my little rip man. Such a cute guy. Love Jesus that. Christ, cute <laughs> guy. guy. No, I mean uh, Luke does some long shows. He's he can get on, you know. If we start at nine, sometimes he'll he'll kick to eleven thirty. You know, so that Luke Bryan. Yep, that's two and a half. That that's, 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 excuse me. I'm trying to think if it was you who told me the story. It was really good. Who's Luke Bryan married to? Is he married to another country singer lady? No. No, that's Garth. Garth is married to Trisha Yearwood. <laughs> Garth Brooks. I love Garth Brooks, but he hasn't toured in years. I don't think. And then Blake Shelton's married to Gwen. Yeah, that's right. You told me one. It was uh, it was, did one of you guys tell me a story about a swimming pool with the guy's wife? Not me. I, <laughs> the wives' swimming pools? No, not I. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> told me this story that was amazing, and we won't say because I don't even know what it was, but it was really fucking funny, man. So I guess it wasn't you. All right, today is four twenty. Who is the most interesting person you've smoked weed with? I don't smoke weed. <laughs> I haven't that many times, believe it or not. Yeah, I never really got into weed. Oh, Jesus. hold on, I take that back. I did smoke weed with Garrett one time on Marilyn Manson. Yes, I did. <laughs> yep. Oh, it is four twenty. You you're very right. I did four twenty. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be relevant. Yeah. I'm trying to. Uh, Today was the cop that busted, dude. Straight fucking across the board, man. <clears throat> Guilty. I have no idea what you're talking about. I I have the George Floyd thing, the guy, the cop with the uh, oh Chauvin, straight across the board, guilty on every, all accounts. <laughs> oh, go figure. Yeah, I, my phone blew up when all the news went off. Yeah, oh, because I'm on the news feed. Yeah, it blew up. Yeah, so I would have found it hard to believe that you could kneel on somebody's neck, kill them, and not nine be min- yeah, found. You could kneel yeah. somebody's neck for nine minutes. <laughs> Listen, the the fact that it's a problem is like they had a two week trial for something that they had on video for twelve minutes. Right. Like they're like you needed to talk about that for two weeks. I hear you. But at the same time, you know, innocent till proven guilty type stuff. But uh, unless there's video, then you're pretty much screwed. The you're screwed. The whole time, right. The whole fucking time, man. <laughs> yeah. Rough. <stuff. clears throat> uh, the weed question's better. I don't know, man. I know the weed question's better. I've never <laughs> smoked weed with Snoop Dogg. I, uh, I, I don't have anybody. I mean, it's it's. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. This, this just, <laughs> we're not that interesting. Nobody cool wants to hang around with me. <laughs> oh, I love some of your story. What was the other one? Um, there was I got a, I got a good Frank story about smoking though. <laughs> All right. What do you have? You Frank smoking in a, a non-smoking venue in a security going security guard. Goes, Sir, you can't smoke in here. They'll find you. And Frank just pulls his wallet out. It's just like, well, how much is the fine? I'm just going to yeah. go ahead and pay for it now. <laughs> I'm such a dick. Yeah. We never, we never, I, I just, there was a lot of things you can't figure out. You go on tour and it's like, well, the guy here today, you're all right. Like the fire marshal, the fire marshals are generally the fun guys, right? They show up way late in the day. They bring like eight firemen with them. Everybody, they're all eating and catering. 
right? Oh, and then, yeah. then, they, then they come and bother you about like, you know, oh, there's a curtain over here in the way. Well, that, that thing's been there since like nine this morning. To now you're a bit late in the game. You know, why are you bothering me? I'm a sound sound comes out of this thing we're touching here. <laughs> like his curtains have nothing to do with me. We had one that was on poison, and so all those guys came and we fucking we we partied, man. We we put every firework we had and we it was pyro Pete and we did it all the all, all night. Like <sighs> all the fucking fire department <clears throat> in the parking lot. It was awesome. Imagine how much shit those guys blow up for fun. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, when I met Pete, you know he has that. Have you guys worked with Pyro Pete? Oh, yeah, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, he's been on a couple too. Yeah, has that tick. You know, when I first met him, I was kind of looking like, is he joking? <laughs> but uh, no, I think I did Guns and Roses with Pyro Pete. <laughs> I think it was. Uh, eh, who cares? But in any event, yeah, those guys are fun, man. They're nuts, but they also take it really seriously. I like the level of professionalism to make sure we don't get hurt. And then make sure you ain't on the back of the stage and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a lot different than it was, you know, 25 years ago. Well, I heard you were, so again, I listened to your interview with the, that Mistress Carrie lady. And uh, from what you were saying, I'm like, man, I don't even, you know, you guys do the stages now and you always push them into place. Like, I didn't do that. Unless I heard your interview wrong. No, the that's that's a common thing nowadays. The lighting rigs have gotten so complicated and so big that you just you wouldn't be able to get them off the ground fast enough if there was a stage in the way. So they basically they run into the building, hang motors, get it up and out of the way, and at the same time that that's being done, backline is on us. The, the stage is being built on the other end of the arena. On the other end, of the, end of the other end of the arena. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So does that mean you guys um, are done at like 11, 12, or I guess it depends on the tour? Or... Yeah, generally by noon time, that stage is is rolling into place. You want to be there around noon, you know, because even then, even when it gets into place, it still takes a good 45 minutes to power it up. You still, it's it's been disconnected from everything. Once it gets into place, now you can, you know, you hook up the walk. cables to it. You can, you can it's get things awesome. finished. But yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, there's some tours that start at like one in the morning when they start rigging. You know, the stage goes still goes into place. You guys both just recently did a gig. I think Frank was working last week, and Maxie, you did a you did a show last week too, right? Or was it? Yeah, I did. I uh, was at the Biloxi Coliseum doing a crawfish festival for two days. Yeah, first time I mixed out in 15 months. I was really had a really uh, had a really good time. It was good to sit behind a console again. Yeah, Frank yeah. has been doing yeah, runs. He's been delivering a equipment, weeks and somebody rear-ended him. I saw that <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah no we we did uh we did the ncaa basketball tournament in uh what is it called lucas oil oil stadium oh nice stadium did super cross there nice place good crew yeah there. Do, you have any, uh, <clears throat> do you have any gigs lined up do you know what you're doing next or still what's that do you guys have any tours lined up or you don't know yet I have possibilities. Uh, Tanya's uh, got dates on the calendar for July, and then Five Figure Death Punch has dates down in fall. So we'll see. Just kind of waiting to see how this stuff goes. I'm going to uh, yeah. stay here and uh, just pick up the local stuff I've been doing and, uh, you know, make the house payment. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks like maybe by July that things are going to start picking up you start seeing everybody's schedule it looks like everything starts in july um i'm hoping i'm, I'm really hopeful this year that you know i i just i literally just got my first vaccine shot today i, wow. I became eligible today's the first day i'm eligible here and uh my arm hurts like a motherfucker. I know, right mine hurts so bad oh, uh, it's, no. i've never had an injection site hurt as much as this one doesn't matter if they had told me I had to drink it out of the skull of my next door neighbor after I beat her to death. I would have done that just so I could go back to work. Um, exactly. But yeah, it's uh, it's Being it's looking. <laughs> my uh, arm hurts so bad, and the lady walks right up to you and just goes, and it's done. And I'm just like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like she inflated your arm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping. I'm hoping by July things start moving. I'm hoping by uh, next spring that there's either enough people vaccinated or enough firewood cleared out. 
Yeah, you to know. calm us down a little bit. Yeah, I agree. You guys I'm three like weeks after my second shot. On the road have, uh... Are they still doing it as much as when I was out with you guys, or is it like tame now? <laughs> Like what is that? Up, like fucking with people, the jokes and the stuff like that. Is it becoming more PC or nah? You still depends who it is. You know, some people don't have a sense of humor. We have a lot more serious people on the road now than we ever did. The the true. positions that's, were quiet. Very, very true, right there. Yes. The you know they're these kids. Kids. I mean, the the young ones that come out. They're network specialists. They're. uh they're much more adept at being able to find a job that has nothing to do with touring. You know, if yeah. you knew sound 25 years ago, it's pretty much all you knew. Yeah. If you know sound now, you're a network specialist, you're a radio system specialist, you're a software specialist. There's a lot of ways that the kids coming out now are more adept. They're, they're more agile as far as what they can do. And at the same time, it's not everybody yelling "yeehaw," you know. Woo! It's a party. It's it's a different kind of person that comes out onto the tours nowadays. So the you went to college to study sound, or no? You went to to study electronics. Yeah, he was so, at full. Frank was at full cell. Yeah. But I was a jerk always. Yeah. <laughs> built in his built in his format. Nobody would have hired you. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's uh i can take a joke i can give a joke it's, it's fine like i don't take offense not everybody's like that anymore yeah i don't know that it's you know I, I don't i don't you know i'm not gonna make jokes at a crew member's expense you know especially if they don't like it there's no fun in that if you're making fun of somebody just to to be a jerk well that's the same you know it's fun to be a smart ass but then if somebody uh, gets offended the joke's not so not so funny you, know, you feel like an asshole well Unless i mean all begin with and you don't care like i said yeah. uh, but i'm unoffendable like there's pretty much nothing you could say to me that's going to bother me for more than like four seconds you know i was on the phone with you four seconds i, I was thinking I like two i was, I was thinking like one or two seconds, seconds. Hey. well <laughs> it takes me two good. seconds to figure it out now i'm not very smart <laughs> that's my line i'm not very smart i said that all the time but I, uh, no, I was on the phone with you and I said, fuck, and you're like, hey, my daughter's here. That was the first time I ever heard you be like, hey. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a different life here at home, man, with kids in the house. I love yeah. the Frank haircuts, man. They're freaking incredible. Hey, Frank's got so much hair now since his daughter cut his hair. I, I was laughing so hard when that was going on. Have you crazy. ever seen? <laughs> yeah, you know that, that you know, was she was having a hard time in all this. Everybody was. Yeah, you know, she can't go to school, right? So are you homeschooling her? I was up until two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Then she went back to school, back like full time. Yeah, at uh -huh. school, morning to 2.30. How many rock stories does she know now? <laughs> Not very many. She's she's come to shows. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hilarious. She, um, She's been to a couple of the shows that I do with Luke. Um, I got her tickets through Chris Musgrave. Thank God for that guy to uh, one of the Disney shows that he was production managing. Cool. And my daughter lost her mind, like to go to that show. She thought like, this is the greatest thing ever. She got to go to a meet and greet and it was all good. And then my neighbors across town who are like lifelong friends of my wife um, wanted to go to Taylor Swift at Gillette Stadium in Massachusetts. So they did it. Right. So my daughter goes to see Taylor Swift and cannot figure out why she just can't walk into catering, why she just can't walk through the truck. And she's like, Mommy, why? Why can't we go down there where everybody like works? She was like, yeah, that's that's not what this is. sweetheart. we're here to see the show. Like we don't nobody we know works this thing. And my, it was like this, you know, oh, shit, what have we done? She thinks she's going to hang out backstage with. Like in every artist she ever goes to see. <laughs> well, you get nice food, which is good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, you know, sure. when my daughter shows up to cater and she's not interested in food, she's interested in the dessert table. <laughs> so, all right, one last story. Or you got more, I don't know. But one of them I love is, uh, so you, you were on tour with somebody, I think it was again in Europe, and they put like sticky shit all over the guys or something. 
Oh, Alice in Chains and Monster Truck. Yeah, what's that one? So Monster Truck, great, amazingly killer rock band from Canada. Uh, immediately, they and the Alice in Chains guys got on like perfectly. It was awesome. Mike, Mike and Ness loved those guys. Yeah, I remember always talking about them. Well, Mike used to come out and do Sorted Beast with them. Like he would play bass for the song. And uh, he was awesome, right? He, they just, again, Mike, Mike is a, uh, he's a throwback because he loves to play. He doesn't care who it's with. He doesn't care what it's for. He loves to play. That's the guy I know, right? Um, he just, he, you can't take an instrument away from him. And he told me the stories about heart where like they would sit up all night long, riding the bus, just playing and singing the sisters and whoever else. I did, run, I did two years on that run with him on that. Yeah. He got me that gig. Right. So he is all about music. It sounds weird to say that now, but it's as a musician, who's all about music. It sounds, it sounds weird to, to think, Oh, well, why are musicians not about music? But um, they they got on. So they, everybody became friendly really fast. And it was decided like the old school, let's fuck with it. So they got a remote control, a couple of remote controlled little trucks from Toys R Us or whatever the Canadian version of it is. And then they got all the gaff tape that was left for the tour and they rolled it, you know, inside out. Like you would stick paper up to a wall. And they just literally carpeted the stage with it in the dark so those guys go on stage all on cables nobody's got a wireless system and oh. within 30 seconds of the first song they are literally looking like sasquatches with this stuff all over them. and as soon as there was room here come these two little re re remote control trucks onto the stage so yeah that was a that was some fun stuff not not typical fooling around with but you've heard the stories like guys, you know, disappearing with, you know, the drum kit gets taken away piece by piece. And, oh, yeah, oh, sure. You know, old. Yep. Yeah. yeah, they took it a little farther. <laughs> so I had Bobby Lee on here last week. And uh, I don't know. Do you remember Bobby Lee? He was the tour manager for the Chili Peppers. When we I were remember there. Bobby. Yep. And Bobby was telling us, so he dropped a bunch of popcorn on the stage. When we were I was there. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I kind of remember the deal. I remember was like it was buttered because I remember, I remember the popcorn. Yeah, and it got and all of the it was buttered, and the barley was so slippery after that. So slippery, and I, I was, oh, it was so slippery. Yeah. It was yeah, and the salt, uh, yeah, and it was like the full blown arena bags that were you know like four feet tall, and they had the riggers just dropping it from the top, and it was popcorn was everywhere, so popcorn. everywhere. Yeah, and then I, I watched the the Pantera guys feather a band. Really? You know, yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Big big fans in the front. You know, to blow the singer's hair back, and they would just empty. They were emptying pillows in front of it. Just feathers everywhere, all over the stage. It was just a, a nightmare. They were awesome for pranks. Those guys, Vince and his brother, caused more grief than anybody I could ever imagine. <laughs> I've never seen those guys. I was working a poison show. They came to a poison show. I didn't know they had been a hair band when they started. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. They all had big, big, big hair. Yeah. And they were all hanging out. And I just was thinking, like, why the fuck would Pantera be at a poison show? But it kind of showed me, like, it's all one family or, like, you know, don't, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, whatever way you want to put it. And um, it was a fun night, man. They were all real cool. They were they had a strip club out there, I think, right? They owned a strip club. Oh, Vince, yeah, he had the clubhouse. Yeah, yeah clubhouse. Vince had to play. Yep, correct. Clubhouse. Yep, that was good. There was there was the Ozfest in uh, two thousand, where Tommy Lee, I think, was like not allowed to go into any bar or something at all. So they they literally pulled his tour bus up into the parking lot where they could just send girls out to him it was amazing yeah. it was that dude got away with murder back then <laughs> they're going oh. back out i think right they're, they're i hope so man i i want to see everybody go back i want to see everybody go back i want i want i want to see everybody doing stadiums i want to see like the bands get back together again 
and go do the arenas. Go sell them out. Go go do gigs. Let I mean, it is what we do. Like life's not supposed to be quiet. Life's not supposed to be. Yeah, it's been quiet for about sixteen months. Sorry, Max. What are you saying? Yeah, I said it's yeah, and it's been quiet for sixteen months. Yeah, trust. Yeah, That's, I think depriving people of what they like makes you appreciate those things more. So what it would make sense is is that when the floodgates open, they're going to be wide open. And I think that you know, there's only so many venues, so there's going to be amazing bills. I think everybody's going to be working. If you want to just travel, I think it's going to be cheap because they're dying for you to come and visit again. So I think the 16 months off, you know, the trying to be a trying to be good about it all is a way for everybody to go back and do those things that we like a lot and appreciate them that much more. I think. Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm never complaining again. Oh, I'll right. never complain. I may complain about my body, but I won't complain about the gig ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that that's 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 over. Yeah. <clears throat> I never heard you guys complain. Well, we're not really the type. Maxie was really good to me, man. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. He would always help me out. Be like, come on, Rifkin. But I mean, he was good. He taught me actually, you taught me more shit than probably anybody else, Maxie. Hey, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Uh, you were really good because I didn't know what the hell was going on. Nobody told me nothing. So when I came out there, I was trying to figure shit out. But it's really hard when nobody's nobody's ever told you anything. So Maxie was good. He helped me out a lot. I always appreciate it. Yeah. Frank, I don't even remember that you were there. I was busy working, dude. <laughs> I was busy working. I didn't know you were on the tour. It's amazing. It's beautiful. <laughs> I I uh no, we got to do. We got to go on. Max, you got to get another boat, and we got to we got to fly out there dude, and do some crawfish and shit. That I'm telling you, crawfish season is in right now. Crawfish just dropped down to like a dollar ninety nine a pound. It's so, I've taken so many crews out on my red boat, man. And then I found out that I sold that boat, and then I found out it burnt in a guy's warehouse. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I and I was so bummed out. And then I sold my big forty two right before Christmas just because of the pandemic. I'll get another one, but man, yeah, taking the cruise out in the boat and taking taking everybody out to uh, mm. Island's always been really good. Or down here, I'm down here on the Tickfall River right now, and I've actually been at the prop stop all day uh, working on audio. And uh, yeah, to come to this place down here, man, it's just uh, I've. Uh, I've been in Spain and France and many places calling everybody here on this river going, I want to come home. I can't wait to get home. But <clears throat> yeah, good place to come. Guy, you know, I'm a landlord now. I had, I had a guy set one of my fucking houses on fire, man. How arsonist set my fucking house on fire. <laughs> <laughs> on purpose? Yeah, man. I had, the, I had the lady, she was going to move in. I asked her to wait 24 hours. <clears throat> I wanted to make sure the, the floors were dry. And some fucking guy set the whole house on fire. <laughs> Did it burn down? He burned a lot of it up. So the insurance company called, uh, they hired a detective. But you know, I don't, the house is in Kansas. I live in California. So the detective, he's on the phone. He goes, okay, sir. He goes, so is your house one story or two? I, yeah, I don't really know. I don't know. <laughs> is it made of brick or is it made of stucco? I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know that one either. <laughs> you know? Oh so, my God. Have you ever seen this house, sir? Eh, nope, never really seen that one before. But it was pretty funny. Oh, there you go. I was your toy carpenter. Is the house made of stucco or brick? I have no idea. I, I really don't know. That one. <laughs> God. No, it's pretty bad. Oh, my gosh. You got any oh dance gosh. stories that I don't know about? Did Dan tour with you guys on anything other than STP? Ozfest. You did Ozfest with them? Yeah. Cool Ozfest was fun. I had, man. <laughs> So good memories on Ozfest. That was fun. Yeah. I learned a lot from Charlie and Opie on that. A lot. I learned. Oh so my much. God. Yeah. yeah. And I apply those efforts. I it's I'll think about what I just did at some gig or something. I'm like, oh, learn that from Charlie. Up, oh, I learned that from Charlie. Learn that from Opie. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a lady. She's coming. Her name's Kimmy Williams. She's a uh, she's a runner in Florida, and she her roommate married Opie. She was the runner at his at his wedding. So oh, I was wow. like, oh, you're in. That's so random. I'm like, you got to go. Well, he was the other redhead. 
Even though I had no prepared <laughs> work. <laughs> you can, you, you're in, you're in. So it was pretty cool. I don't know. Well, guys, before we all get boring, I don't know, unless anybody's got some amazing stories I forgot to pry. Max, you got anything? I, I, I sucked Frank dry. I think I sucked. Dry. Oh, man, you know what? He brought back some good memories here. I've, I've been enjoying just sitting here listening because I knew Frank's memory is so much better than mine. Something about being my age in, in my late 50s, I can't remember hardly anything anymore. I love Frank's stories. The reason I love Frank's stories is because they're always random. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You're an> <laughs> storyteller. There's no real shit talk, and they're just good stories. They're just fun, whatever bullshit story. Dude, there, there's no reason to shit talk. I mean, every everybody has been a dope at least once. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, um, I'll say this though. Like, I try not to have bad days. Yeah. Like at work, I used to be known for like as kind of a fucking hard ass. Right. I didn't like putting up with bullshit. I wanted everybody to <laughs> work right? And do their job. And that was really it. And when they didn't, I'd get in their asses over it, especially if it was one of the guys that was working for us. Um, and I mean, that, that attitude still with me. I'm probably a lot nicer about it than I used to be. But at the same time, uh, it's more important to teach than it is to scare people. Exactly. It, it, if you're busy, yelling, that approach right there too. What's yeah. that? I've taken that same approach of the teaching side versus the barking side sometimes. And just, you know, it works out so much better. Yeah. For me, it was like, I, it was, it was a time of like, uh, you, you went out on the road, not knowing anything. And then you got beat up by everybody else until you either learn the gig or quit and just didn't do it again. Right. And that really is like a, a shitty way to behave because it's like it's like judging a fish on its tree climbing ability. Like it's not supposed to do that. How is it supposed to know how to do that? Right? It's not in its element. And it's just wrong. I mean, you're going to burn people out. Like, uh, I don't, much as I love what I do, it's not my, it's not my life. Like, I don't, I'm not identified by it. So it's if when the di when the time comes and I have to retire, like I just got a 16 month dose of what retirement's going to be like. Yeah, it's terrifying. You know, it's exactly. a little bit scary. Yeah, what do but, you do? Start a new video game? I mean, what? Do you well, no, but at the same time, I can't like be upset that there's young people coming into the business and I want to keep working and I want to. You know, at some point, I'm going to become irrelevant. Somebody's going to go. Who needs that old sound guy? There? Like he doesn't know shit about our music. It's it's one of those things where you try and stay relevant by I'm not gonna put on like disco glasses and a velour suit and go try and pick up 20 year olds, right? I'm not trying to be that guy. But at the same time, <laughs> I, I like appreciate it too. Just to <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they do. But you know what I mean? I'm not trying to be hip with the kids. I'm trying to just pass on what I learned in a less painful method than I had to learn. If if that means anything coming out of this after all this time is like a lot of people didn't make it this far they didn't survive slapping around to appreciate you know, I, I, I had a guy he uh i worked at a recording studio before i met you guys and i hated it dude i didn't want to be a sound engineer i think that was rough I, I just didn't like it it wasn't for me and he was he wasn't ever an asshole he never was but he was tough he just wasn't that friendly and he goes do you know how much he worked at death row records and he's like do you know how much shit i got he goes, I was going to make you earn it. <laughs> I was going to make you appreciate that you fucking were working for free because, man, they were mean to me. You know, and I, after all the years of being with you guys, I, uh, you know, my thought goes back to like, how come I wasn't fired? And in my book, a lot of it is how come I wasn't fired? But I think it's because I cared. I wanted to do good, even though I kept fucking up all the time. I wanted, I wanted to be good. I wanted to do a good job. I cared. So I think that's the difference. I hope that people now that get into the industry, it's a career, it's a job and care, make an effort, whether it's the Sex Pistols or, or any of these other band, Linda Ronstadt, you know, it, it's still, it's a gig and you take it seriously and you do the best you fucking can do. So I think it's still the same thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, Max, I, I could say this. I think the highlight of my career is the multiple highlights of being able to stand near geniuses and help them do what they do because a lot of them are 
you know, no, they're, 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 they're on another level. They're on another level. And what I used to appreciate was like, it's not that they can play the guitar or whatever. It's the fact that you could hang out and like Sully would come up with a new lick right in front of you that fast. It's the speed that they can come up with a brand new original idea that you're totally floored by. That's cool. You like, yeah. you literally work for the best artists in the world and you watch a guy and you're just kind of like, wow, you're really fucking good. It's getting that first record again. It's, it's a great way to live. It's very neat. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, if you love what you do, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, we could all be auto mechanics talking about NASCAR, right? Hey, I've been being a boat mechanic, boat mechanic. So, hey, you know, <laughs> Mark, <laughs> whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Facility. Have you guys ever worked for Mark Hope? Uh, I know Mark very well, but I have never worked. I, never worked I have him. not. Yeah. Mark took us to the NASCAR facilities and that was the shit. It was really neat because my dad was a car mechanic. So oh, wow. to see them do what they would do in the NASCAR That's stuff. That's very cool. Impressive. Yeah. Amazing, dude. Yeah. If you get to go out with Mark, maybe see i don't know if he can but if he can get you to go to there oh man it was so cool we went to jeff gordon's nascar facility and we got to look oh really oh wow yeah. that would be very cool yeah it was very be. cool you know I, was, my dad was car mechanic, but i don't know that much about cars but going in there it's just amazing all the tools and everything they have <clears throat> like yeah there's there's lot right you still see the levels to the game doesn't matter what what the task is, whether you're a car mechanic who's working on VWs in some back alley garage or whether you're a car mechanic who's working on Jeff Gordon's car. Right. There's the same skill, but there's levels to that skill. And it's kind of the same. It's exactly the same in our business. Well, there's guys tons of guys, guys, tons of guys and, and, and ladies. You know, I don't, I don't not in the pejorative, but like. It just it's hard to describe. Like you, you there's <laughs> levels to this. Well, yeah, there's like you're at the top level now that Davey's gone. <laughs> you guys are you guys are there, man. You guys are there. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Scotch. Hey. Uh, bur bourbon. I'm not that fancy. <laughs> Iced tea. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you old prick. We don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> Surprised you're not waving a bottle of Grey Goose around. No, oh, that would be. I, Frank remembers those days. Oh yeah, I'd be all up in that great. I remember right. everything. You're Every all going bar. down. If they find out I'm terminal, you're all going down. <laughs> I would keep a journal. That's how I did the book thing. But how do you remember this shit? Are you just like journaling when we're not looking all day long? Because it's incredible, man. I write it. I used to write it down in the bunk at night. So I would, I would, I got a computer because I had, I got per diem for the first time and I, I spent it on a computer. But the problem was, this is the infancy of the internet and I didn't know what to do with this thing. So I started writing about my day. So I'd be like, Max, you know, Maxi schooled me like a little bitch last night because he hung out literally, Maxi would hang out literally all fucking night, dude. And I, and I would try <laughs> and I'm 20 some years old. So what am I'm 43 now, Maxi. So what are you like? 50 48 49 me i'm 59 yeah 59 okay so but maxi was like a pro he could hang out all fucking night and i could just never like i can't do it i can't do it <laughs> i couldn't keep up I couldn't hey keep I'm, up with I'm still out running some 21 year olds here yeah, on tours right. they're like dude slow down i'm like yeah catch up <laughs> yeah but you can do it you and i can do it like one or two days a week but we pay for it the rest of the week Oh, I'm paying for it now. I'm still hoarse from that festival this weekend. I'm so I can't even hardly talk. <laughs> I'm like two days of drinking water and not drinking and just bitching about how I don't feel good. Oh, yeah. Um, that would be me drinking water after so much. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> All right, boys. I think on that note, <laughs> that <was a> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, this has been fun. This has been a good one really for fun. sure. Right. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back upstairs and uh, put my kid to bed. New stories. I hope you guys get back to work. I really appreciate the time that I got to spend with you on the road. I get to appreciate the time that I spent with you just now. Thank you guys for being good mentors to me. I really appreciate you too. Oh, for sure. Always, buddy. Yeah, anything we could do, man. This is fun. Getting to talk. I'm sorry I didn't get to see Max today. But uh, <laughs> you know, if uh, you know, if you if you haven't talked to somebody in a while, give them a call. They might appreciate it more than you know. 
Well, I was going to do this by phone, and then I actually got some Wi-Fi, so I actually set up my Mac to uh, so I could get on here. Oh, I wish <laughs> I had you on the thing. My girlfriend's yeah. going to send you a list of what I need to improve upon. If you guys could let me know, that'd be helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'd say research your fucking subjects before you get started here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you want from me? I've been drinking the whole time here. Excellent. I would research right. more if the guests were more interesting. Yeah, well, there's not. I haven't done much in 25 years. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, I haven't done much. I, was just I just recently months. got into the Sex Pistols more, and uh, that was cool because I just, they were so good. I mean, really, really, you know, those albums that you hear as a kid, you think are great, but then you hear as an adult again, and you're just kind of floored with how truly amazing they are. Just next level, absolutely incredible. That was me with the yeah. Sex Pistols like a year ago. It was after watching that video. You got to find that one. And it, it you'll laugh your ass off. I mean, it just Johnny Rotten, super drunk. It's with Duff McKagan, Henry Rollins, some of oh, those guys. I mean, wow. Yeah, I bet that I bet that is good. Oh, it's so, <laughs> so, so good. You're going to love it. You know, it's funny because uh, I remember Steve Jones and Duff in a, in a bar in Hamburg when we were on the Soundgarden tour. They were there with what neurotic outsiders, and somehow or another, a glass breaking contest broke out. Oh, and then, God. bar glass that's that was an I, I literally pieced out, walked right out of the whole scene when I, shit started going down with that. And I was like, I gotta get out of here, there's something going down, I'm out. Um, yeah, they were uh, Jonesy was something else, great guy. Yeah, he's great guy. His radio thing. He's a cool guy. Yeah, I like listening to him. I think he's uh I think he's interesting. I like him. I've heard him with the Bill Burr podcast, and it's hilarious. Bill Burr. It's Bill hilarious. Burr. Yeah, he just they <laughs> just mo he just mocks Bill, but not really. Like he's a very gentlemanly guy. Like he's a really nice man. It's hard, it's hard to describe. Like you think of him as like, oh, he's a guitar player, but he was a great guy. Um, we're, we're English. We're we're, we're better. We speak the language. Then what? We speak the language properly. We shower. <laughs> yeah. Right. When yeah. you're pulling fucking swords out of stones to decide who's going to be the fucking leader of the country, you might have a fucking problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. That's over our head. We have no idea what you're talking about. Guys, all right. We're forward to part two. And uh, there'll be a lot of embarrassed roadies for having to, to listen to that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that was the wrong one. They had it coming. They had it coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to throw it hey, we worked hard to get where we are. <laughs> yeah, you guys did. You honestly really did. So it's cool. All right. Talk to you guys soon. All right. You guys have a good night. Fine. Thanks Take for care. everything, Joel. Yeah. Joel Max, I'll see you later. Yeah, for sure. You guys be safe, man. You have a good night.